Okay. Excellent. Okay. All right, you have seven minutes. Go for it, Barrett. Thank you, Barrett. Thank you. Hey there. Thanks Hello. for coming out, everyone. Uh, my name is Jason Leopold, and I am uh, the senior investigative reporter at uh, BuzzFeed News. And thanks to Lisa and the Internet Archive for inviting me here to uh, speak with you about FOIA uh, on Aaron Schwartz Day. And before I start, I'll, uh, I'll just give a little bit of background uh, about uh, Aaron and how he inspired me uh, to free information. And I was, uh, I was very fascinated by uh, not only all the work that he did in, in, in such a short time, but um, after he passed away, he, I took a look at the, the um, I, I was trying to find answers like everyone else was trying to find answers. And uh, I took a look at these Freedom of Information Act requests that he filed with uh, various government agencies. I was fascinated by how he had aggressively tried to pursue uh, information, try to obtain information uh, from the government. I'm sure as everyone knows, you know, the Freedom of Information Act is uh, a 50-year-old law um, that essentially allows anyone anywhere in the world uh, to uh, obtain uh, documents from the U.S. government. These are our documents, the, you know, the public records. Uh, and he used it, what I would think uh, or characterize as quite aggressively. And uh, afterwards, I, you know, started, uh, after I started looking into his requests, uh, I too started uh, using it quite aggressively. Um, interestingly, uh, maybe a few weeks ago, uh, a little, uh, about a month ago, I received some documents that I filed uh, with uh, the Executive Office of U.S. Attorneys. So to backtrack um, for a second, after Aaron passed away, I wrote a story about all the Freedom of Information Act requests he had filed. And I thought that maybe some of these Freedom of Information Act requests would would, would hold some answers. Uh, uh, obviously, during this, um, uh, the, the, the critical time and what he happened to have been going through uh, and dealing with with regards to the government and uh, uh, at that time, which I, by the way, saw as just this unbelievable injustice. So, um, so I wrote about his requests. He, he had one request on, uh, I think it was to the Department of Treasury, but it was on a platinum coin. He wanted some information on this uh, platinum coin. Um, he, he did not get any records. He also filed a Freedom of Information Act request with, uh, I believe it was the Defense Department, for uh, videotapes uh, that showed um, uh, the abuse of Chelsea Manning. Uh, he didn't get anything on that. Um, but afterwards, I started to file requests with uh, various government agencies, the Executive Office of U.S. Attorneys, which would have been you know, the, uh, uh, the main office that handled uh, the pursuit, prosecution uh, of Aaron, uh, the Department of Homeland Security, Secret Service, FBI. Oddly, a, couple of weeks, a few weeks ago, I received some documents from the um, Executive Office of, Home, uh, of U.S. Attorneys on Aaron, and I have not gone through these documents. I'm assuming that some of them have already been released, but um, they are heavily redacted. Uh, you know, these are supposed to be some images here. Um, they're they're redacted, uh, but um, I haven't had a chance to go to go through some of these records. Uh, there's you know something here from. Uh, the Secret Service. Um, point being that it's it was it's been a battle uh, and incredibly difficult to try and pry loose information. Um, you know, even five years later. So, you know, let me just tell you a little bit about myself and 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 how I use the Freedom of Information Act, why I think it's important, um, and uh, how. It's, uh, it's, it's allowed me to uh, break a number of stories. Uh, 
obviously I'm a journalist, I like to free information, but I also love landing scoops. Uh, and that's what I'm thinking about when I'm, when I'm filing FOIAs. So, you know, when I was, when I first started using the Freedom of Information Act, it, it happened almost by accident. And uh, this was around 2000, late 2009, early 2010. I had filed FOIA requests during the Bush administration, but mostly relied on anonymous sources to uh, report. And uh, having you know, gotten into some hot water for uh, using anonymous sources, uh, around late 2009, early 2010, uh, a person that, that I had been speaking with handed me a bunch of documents and said, hey, I think there may be a story here. So I took a look at these documents and they were from the, um, they were from the Air Force. And what these documents showed is uh, that these were a, power, a PowerPoint presentation. And these documents showed that the Air Force trained uh, uh, nuclear missile officers so these are the men and women who turn the keys uh, on the ethics and morals of launching nuclear weapons. Uh, and these PowerPoint slides showed uh, or had depictions of Jesus Christ um, on a horse holding a nuclear missile uh, and a former Nazi SS uh, soldier who who's also happens to be the father of the modern day space program. These two examples of the ethics and morals of launching nuclear weapons. Essentially it was, look, Jesus would not launch a nuclear weapon if he had the opportunity to. Um, and this Nazi is, you know, he was a Nazi, but he's a great guy and he would, you know, uh, he would have done it as well. And, and I couldn't believe what these documents showed. So I contacted the Air Force and they said, oh yeah, you know, this, this, uh, uh, this has been in existence for uh, two decades. This is what we use during our training. Uh, and uh, it's, nobody's had any complaints about it. I decided to, you know, to, to write a story. It was incredibly newsworthy. And uh, nice colorful pictures in these documents. And as soon as I put out the story, I was blown away by the response, uh, by how people responded to primary source material, how they responded to just you know, having the opportunity to see you know, your, your evidence right there. And within 24 hours, the Air Force suspended this, um, this training program uh, because then other people, you know, found it offensive and perhaps not so ethical, but uh, I found it very newsworthy. And when the, within a week, uh, it was uh, canceled. Um, they ended it, so after two decades. So the power of, um, of information, of, of, of prying loose information, of freeing information, uh, particularly the government's own documents, and seeing how people responded to it uh, was amazing. And at this time, I had been covering national security, uh, covering uh, um, issues such as the, uh, you know, the CIA's torture program, Guantanamo, uh, various covert programs that uh, uh, um, intelligence agencies were working on. So it was very, very difficult um, being a reporter at that time, uh, and, and even, uh, it, it still exists now, but it was very difficult to get anyone to obviously speak on the record, to, to talk about the, the CIA's torture program, for example. Uh, we know that people who have spoken out about it have been prosecuted uh, for uh, revealing classified information uh, or um, uh, violating non-disclosure agreements. That was one thing I dealt with whenever I tried to interview uh, someone at Guantanamo. Uh, when you serve at Guantanamo, they actually make you sign a non-disclosure agreement, which essentially says you can never talk about Guantanamo. So I started to use the Freedom of Information Act aggressively to um, try and get answers to, to many questions. Uh, that I had, uh, for example, you know, what, what was happening uh, in, uh, in Bagram when the CIA was there? Uh, how was the uh, uh, military force-feeding detainees 
uh, at Guantanamo? What was the standard operating procedure? So um, I started to file these requests and much to my surprise, I started to get records back. Now I should say that at this time, um, it was not that difficult to get documents back. It's become a lot, a lot more difficult for me uh, right now, and I'll get into that uh, in a bit. But uh, I started to, you know, to uh, obtain these records, and uh, I was very fortunate to, you know, to break a number of stories. For example, a story about uh, how the CIA uh, played a very uh, heavy role, uh, prominent role in the production of Zero Dark Thirty. Um, and uh, uh, I did obtain the standard operating procedures uh, on uh, Guantanamo force feeding, which was then turned into a video by Mos Def, uh, um, in which he tried to undergo um, force feeding. But I started to I, I started to use this tool aggressively, and uh, my goal at that time which still exists now, was to basically build a pipeline. And, and anyone who's heard me speak before has probably heard me say this. I try to file at least you know, five to 10 requests per week uh, with the hope that you know, eventually when the agencies get around to it, that uh, by, the time I, by the time they get around to it, some time will pass, and I will get a steady stream of documents in my mailbox you know, every day. Uh, and that's certainly the case now. Um, sometimes it doesn't work out where, you know, it becomes a, uh, where it will result in a news story as, you know, these documents on, on Aaron uh, is evidence of that. But, um, you know, the, the key to, the, the, the key to getting documents from the government, one, you have to have a really, really good template. That's, that's what's worked for me. A good FOIA template, you need to know how these agencies work. I've seen many, many FOIA requests, and I've seen people simply say, I want all the emails from uh, Hillary Clinton, which, by the way, um, I did force the release of that via FOIA. Sorry. So, um, uh, you know, you, you have to... <laughs> um, you have to know how agencies work. And, uh, and, and you, you need to know what the, where, documents, uh, where documents could be stored. So for example, the Department of Homeland Security. This is a massive government agency that has many different offices within the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, there's the department, or there's the civil rights and civil liberties section, there's Secret Service, there's Marshal Service, there's ICE, there's CBP, uh, there's intelligence and analysis. Uh, if you're looking for documents, say, on perhaps the Department of Homeland Security, on how they, uh, how that agency uh, monitored protests, maybe it was protests after, after the uh, inauguration, what are the likely offices within the Department of Homeland Security that would have such records. So obviously civil rights and civil liberties and intelligence and analysis. Um, but in order to understand that, you have to kind of do quite a bit of research. So I spend a lot of time researching, understanding systems of record. That's so important. I can't stress that enough. You should write that down if you, if you uh, uh, file Freedom of Information Act requests. And by the way, let me just note that I'm also talking about federal FOIA. Uh, systems of record are, are where records are stored, or the various systems that agencies have that maintain records. And uh, these are uh, the places where, you know, you can find um, uh, perhaps various databases that the government uh, uh, is maintaining. Um, and it will also help you cut down on the time uh, uh, by which an agency responds to your Freedom of Information Act request. So, for example, if you sent a FOIA request about protests into Maine DHS uh, without telling that that um, without telling the agency where to look for records, 
it's just going to keep getting routed and routed, and they're going to they're going to be the ones that have to try and figure out where to look for those records. So you can actually save yourself about six months, no joke, um, a six months time, if you simply just you know spend a little time online, understanding the internal you know structures of these agencies, uh, the organizational chart. Right, that's something to look at. FBI, for example, um, has many different uh, 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 divisions within the FBI, as does the CIA. And uh, understanding, you know, that that these agencies have different components and different parts to it, and then uh, look at the systems of record. So, you know, if you're looking for, you know, when I was looking for the CIA's torture program. Um, you know, I, I look mainly to the clandestine division at the CIA, which I knew was largely responsible for, you know, for that program. Uh, eventually, when I wanted to, you know, spread it out a bit, uh, you know, you, you go to the Office of General Counsel and all the various different components within an agency. So, um, one of the main questions that, uh, or one of the questions that uh, I'm often asked is, you know, how do I figure out what, what to FOIA? And um, I'll tell you, I wake up every day saying, oh my God, I, I, I don't know, what do I do? I don't know what to FOIA. And then I read a news article and I'm like, I'm FOIAing that. So uh, an example is, um, this is actually a recent example. So the Daily Beast published a story um, a couple of months ago after Sebastian Gorka was uh, booted out of the White House. And uh, buried in this story was a mention that Sebastian Gorka was supposed to speak at U.S. Army Special Operations Command, um, uh, but the talk was postponed or canceled. I was like, what would Sebastian Gorka be doing at you know, U.S. Op uh, Special Operations Command, and why is he speaking there? Um, at the Special Operations uh, uh, School. So I FOIA that, FOIA, you know, the uh, Special Operations, and I, I essentially asked for, you know, what would exist, what would be there? Um, I'm thinking, well, if he's speaking there, maybe he would share his remarks with them, uh, you know, prior to, perhaps there's some email traffic between Special Operations and you know, Sebastian Gorka uh, at the White House. Um, so I, I asked for all of that. And a couple of weeks later, they sent me these emails, which were amazing. And, uh, and, and uh, I uh, also spoke to people uh, at Special Operations who told me on background that, uh, oh man, um, you know, uh, he was gonna give this, uh, you know, this, this diatribe, this uh, anti-Islamic, diatribe and, and uh, um, that's essentially what he was booked for. So uh, that was just, again, I didn't know if they would have any documents. I suspected they did, but I found that by reading a news story just like, you know, you guys do. Anytime, you know, I see that there's, you know, a protest and we know that there's a, a heavy-handed government response, I'll always FOIA the FBI, the Department of Homeland Security, um, depending on where it is, you know, uh, perhaps Secret Service or Park Service. So it's, you know, I'm, I'm always looking at news stories, anything that mentions anonymous sources, anything that will mention a memo or somebody obtaining a memo that they then don't post and I want a copy of, uh, I'll ask for that. I also use what's already out there, what's already been released, what these agencies publish online uh, and mine that for, uh, for information to file additional Freedom of Information Act requests. So for example, every government agency has an inspector general, uh, a watch, an internal watchdog. And now there is a new website that um, essentially houses all of these uh, uh, inspector general reports. So I'm always looking through these inspector general reports um, for, to, to mine it for information to file additional Freedom of Information Act requests. Um, you know, quick story on that. Uh, I saw that in one uh, Inspector General report, 
um, I think it was, I, again, I think it was the Department of Homeland Security, uh, there was some allegations of you know, sexual assault um, and um, child pornography. You know, an, a, 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 an employee was um, uh, fired for looking at child pornography on the computer, on a government computer. And I will tell you what's bizarre is that I have like a, a giant pile of Inspector General reports about government employees being fired for looking at child pornography on their government computers. I don't get it. But uh, the, um, I, I ended up filing a Freedom of Information Act request for um, uh, documents on, on sexual assault within you know, the Department of Homeland Security. And you know, sure enough, there was uh, uh, quite a bit of material there. You know, the agency told me that it would take um, quite a bit of time to gather this material and, and, and turn it over. Um, so, you know, there is a lot of value in looking at what has already been released, even looking at documents that have been released to try to mine that for information, for data, to uh, advance uh, another FOIA request. Um, uh, recently, there was a FOIA lawsuit that I filed against the FBI for a certain set of uh, documents related to Donald Trump back in the 80s. And uh, we did that uh, after, uh, when I say we, um, someone who I work with uh, regularly, Ryan Shapiro, he's a, a doctoral student at uh, MIT. And we often file joint FOIA lawsuits, but uh, someone else had, had provided us with information about uh, this particular FBI document, and it actually had the case number on it, or the case file number. And so we then took that file number and then asked for everything in that file. Um, point being that there's many ways in which you know you can uh, you can find information. So I said at the beginning that it was kind of easy at first. Um, now the government hates me and I've become a thorn in their side. Uh, the FBI referred to me as a, uh, a FOIA terrorist. Um, a couple of months ago, the, uh, the NSA, uh, who I recently sued to probably lose four years worth of Inspector General reports, uh, filed a motion in court, uh, essentially saying that I have weaponized FOIA, uh, that uh, I've deluged the government with, uh, with FOIA requests, and that is the only reason that uh, BuzzFeed News hired me. So, um, so it's not easy to, for me to, to, to get records at this point. You know, when, I, when I would ask the FBI for certain documents, uh, it took a while, but I would get them. Uh, now I really have to, uh, you know, now I find myself suing a lot more often. So I currently have, I don't know how many have been closed, but within the past eight years, I've sued the government 41 times. And, uh, you know, um, uh, thank you. And the, the, before I open it up to questions, you know, the one thing I will say about that is, um, you know, the freedom of, last year, the, the uh, Congress passed these FOIA amendments codifying um, a memo that President Obama issued in 2009 uh, that uh, essentially says that all, agen all agencies should act with presumption of disclosure. And uh, it was my hope, as it, as it was many people who use the Freedom of Information Act, that all the agencies would say, all right, now we gotta release these records. It, it, these amendments were, suppo were supposed to make it easier for us to obtain these records, uh, and it's supposed to make it easier for government agencies to release these records. And that certainly has not been the case this year. I, I have found it to be uh, uh, quite a bit, quite difficult to pry loose records out of this administration, and I'm not sure why. I'm not sure if it's simply the, uh, the agencies, the analysts are saying, we don't have to release them now because we're, you know, um, working with an administration that, uh, you know, they don't care, they don't want records released. Um, but it's important, these are, you know, the, the, these are the public's records. 
so, um, so I'm hoping that you know we'll start to see a steady stream of uh, of records flowing out of this government, out of this administration, uh, out of these government agencies. But it's been you know it's been a battle. FOIA is a battle. When I sue the government, it's it's because you know I feel that you know out of the thousands of FOIA requests I still have outstanding, you know I feel that it's um, you know these are documents that are really really important and have to be released. Uh, that uh, it's crucial to inform the bu uh, the public in a timely manner, as opposed to you know sitting back and waiting, you know for four years. I mean, I filed this request four years ago, uh, and they only you know then they sent it to another agency two years ago, and now I have it, um, and it's heavily redacted, and now I have to appeal it. So, speaking of you know appeals, I'll add this note. Um, Whenever you receive a response back from the government, um, whether it's a denial or even if you get records, I would always appeal. I, I appeal everything. I appeal redactions, I appeal denials, I appeal uh, whenever they say we conducted a thorough search uh, because I believe there, there's always more uh, records that, exi that exist there. And um, uh, let me just see if I had a, another note. Um, and yeah, and finally, I think that it's in, uh, very, very important if you're going to use FOIA is to um, finally look at the FOIA logs. Um, generally, people think that journalists make up the majority of FOIA requesters, and that's just simply not true. Uh, it's corporations, it's lawyers, uh, it's other parties who then you know, file requests and resell documents. Uh, journalists make up just a sliver of, uh, of all the FOIA requests that are, uh, that are filed, and there's more than 700,000 uh, that have been filed with the government, uh, with all government agencies. So uh, you're seeing an uptick, and you're also seeing just a massive, you know, a massive backlog uh, that exists. So, you know, perfecting your FOIA requests is key. Uh, filing good uh, FOIA requests and having a good solid template is important. And, and so I would simply just uh, uh, encourage everyone to uh, read the FOIA logs to get a sense of what everyone else is asking for uh, and you know, read other requests, read other templates. Um, and uh, uh, there's a nice little FOIA community out there. So you know, reach out. And I will open it up to questions. Great. And thank you. <laughs> Great. Thank you. I'm trying to talk. Great. So yeah, I, I purposefully left a lot of time for questions because I knew there'd be people that would want to know stuff. Great. Uh, thank you very much. That was incredibly interesting. So I just wanted to. Interesting, like good. Or <laughs> interesting. Very good. Very good. Um, so you talked a little bit about the work you do with Ryan Shapiro, and there's others who um, also are um, foying a lot of documents. How do you as a community, well, I guess this is a question, is there a community of journalists who share information and tips about how to go about um, getting documents? Yes, uh, depends on what it is. What the what we're looking for in terms of filing, um, in terms of you know how to ask, uh, say the FBI for a certain set of records. Yes, we do share tips with each other. Uh, there's workshops, uh, you know, for journalists, you know, investigative reporters and editors um, is a, um, a group, you know, made up of investigative journalists and editors. And uh, we often share tips with each other. We have FOIA tip sheets. Uh, you know, it, the, the, it's important that, that um, you know, we, we try and help each other in terms of uh, understanding, you know, how to obtain records. Uh, because the government, I mean, look, you know, the government is constantly trying to um, stonewall the release of records. Uh, you know, I can't tell you how many times the FBI has lied, you know, about records.
records that they claim they have that, um, or that they don't have that I know that they have. Let me just give you like a quick example about that, which is, again, I'll use Aaron Schwartz as an example. I asked the executive office at U.S. attorneys for records on him, uh, Carmen Ortiz, who was prosecuting him. They said they had no records. There was nothing. And, I mean, of course they have records. I know they're lying. Uh, and sure enough, I appealed, and here we are, right? I've got these. But um, because it's so difficult, and because some of us are, are uh, a little bit more skilled at it, we do often assist each other. So it, it, there is a nice community there where we'll share tips. But if it's, you know, if somebody tells me a, um, I mean, I certainly won't share story tips, <laughs> but FOIA tips, yes. Jason, first, um, congratulations on the accolades you've been winning from the government for being such a great adversarial journalist. I'm curious, when you're forced to sue the government and the government... Uh, are in a way pointless is because it, it doesn't, there, there's no accountability, there's no penalty, there's no fine, there's no threat of jail time for, you know, essentially saying that, um, you know, they don't have any records. So no, uh, it, it, at, at, the, at most, they'll be admonished by the judge. Uh, when the NSA made this argument um, uh, and disparaged me, it disparaged me in this, in this court filing, and it was just unbelievable when they said I was weaponizing FOIA. Um, and they also claimed that they had this massive backlog that they could not possibly get to uh, in time. Um, the judge made them disclose, and they make them disclose every month their FOIA statistics. I, I felt that that was like a huge win because now that's, again, more information that gets released about an agency that claims it's, you know, really busy. But that's, that's the long answer. Um, unfortunately, there is no, no one is held accountable for, you know, for doing that. Okay. Yes, there's um, the, the uh, ability and, to obtain attorney's fees, which is, uh, I'm very happy for my attorneys to be able to get lots and lots of attorney's fees. But again, even that is, you know, uh, for the amount of work that's put in, you know, that, that uh, uh, my attorney's put in, and you know, my attorney, Jeffrey Light, has been just incredible um, in terms of being able to uh, help me obtain these records. But um, it's, you know, it's a battle. I actually think this is fun um, and frustrating, but I love, it's like, I love this fight. You know, it's like, I'm getting your records, you know, and, and, and then I'm going to sue you. And what are you going to do? You know, but give them to me. So we had a question from the internet and from my hand over to Steve here, and that was, um, uh, they were complaining that you were waiting too long for your FOIA requests to be filled, and you shouldn't be waiting that long. And I said, well, how long should he be waiting? And they said, well, what's the law? How, how quickly are they supposed to respond? So, you know, the um, federal law, again, we're talking about federal. FOIA and, and public records laws on the state level are vastly different, and each state has their own um, uh, their, their, their own laws, and FOIA works differently on that level. But on the federal level, uh, 21 days is when you know, the government has to respond to you. Um, and essentially, they're supposed to give you records in that time frame, uh, which never happens. Uh, although I will say that those Sebastian Gorka documents, emails, they gave it to me in 10 days. That was like, wow. I assume they wanted me to have it. Um, 
but uh, they gave it to me very quickly. But uh, generally, you know, they're supposed to respond within like a three-week time frame. And uh, once, you know, right after that, it sort of opens it up where you can litigate. All right, this on. Okay, uh, a couple things. So uh, I thought it was very interesting what you were saying about, you know, if you can understand the structure of these agencies and you can, like, submit FOIA requests much more effectively. What do you think the best ways are to obtain that, uh, that, that knowledge? And, you know, do you interview someone who works there? Hey, by the, you know, hi, I'm, so, uh, hi, I'm Joe Schmo. Can you tell me about, you know, who might know this information or whatever? Are there ways to ask it so that you can, you know, not maybe necessarily say you're going to submit a FOIA request or yeah. whatever? And so on the systems of record, you know, you can obviously just Google that and every agency posts their systems of record, you know, the record notices online. Um, I often, I, I don't know how many people here work with some of the analysts or the FOIA liaisons at, at government agencies, but I'm, I'm on the phone with them on a regular basis. I find them to be incredibly helpful. Um, and I certainly don't want to paint them as the, um, the bad guys, so to speak. I feel that they're, uh, they can be very helpful in, one, telling me how to, you know, perhaps perfect a request. Let me give you another example. Uh, I recently filed a request with the Department of Homeland Security um, for John Kelly, for emails in which John Kelly uh, perhaps used the word Muslim. And the public liaison of the Department of Homeland Security responded to me and said, hey, can we get on a call and talk about this? And uh, I said, sure. So somebody I speak to on a regular basis, she said, look, um, I want you to get the records that you want. Uh, but here's what you need to know. We don't have the ability, and this is, may sound surprising, perhaps they're lying, I don't know, but we don't have the ability to just search for one word. You have to use conjunctive, she actually said, you have to use conjunctive phrases in your request. Um, I was like, huh, interesting. So, you know, we talked it out. Um, and I put in my request. She also gave me a tip. She said, you're asking for um, talking points. Uh, for us, you should ask for briefing books. So each time the Secretary of Homeland Security has a meeting, we prepare a briefing book. That's subject to FOIA. So that was valuable information, right? Those, that only happened as a result of having those conversations. So I regularly try to have those conversations. They actually like speaking to people, believe it or not. Um, and, uh, you know, again, aside from that, I really try to look online and read these public rec or these uh, system of record notices. Um, you know, it became a tiny bit tedious having to refile the um, request for John Kelly and using the word Muslim. So um, last month, I just sued DHS for all of John Kelly's emails. It's like, all right, let's just do that. <laughs> all right, cut to the chase. Yeah. And I just, oops, sorry. Okay. I just wanted to say that I had very limited experience with this kind of thing, and I had the same experience that um, it was, they were the government officials or, or the people that are answering the phone. Um, when you ask them very specific questions, they seem to be kind of like a librarian. It's, exactly, it's, it's like yeah. very happy to give you more information. And um, I don't know, it, it was a very interesting experience. So I just wanted to make that point. Again, and, and you try, you know, you don't start off asking a bunch of questions. You know, you just call the first time, right? Yeah. And maybe the second time, and you're kind of like, oh, I was wondering this. And then one day they'll be chatty. Who knows why? You let them talk, right? It, it was These are the, you know, the analysts, the people who sort of, you know, sign your letters uh, for the most part. I mean, their job is to push these FOIAs through, to get this done. Uh, they're not thinking like, oh, Jason is looking for, you know, documents on Osama bin Laden's porn collection, which, by the way, the CIA won't release. Um, but, you know, they're thinking, here's another request that just came through. I have 6,000 outstanding that I have to finish up this month. He, I don't know what he's asking for. He's saying Muslim, John Kelly, I don't know how to do this. That's what they're thinking. You know, they're thinking, here, let me help you 
so we can push this through. Because what happens is, is that you know, the FOIA says you simply need to reasonably describe the records you're seeking, and then an agency has to respond. Um, and as I was you know, telling someone earlier, you can go back and forth with the agency for months and months and just fight over email, uh, back and forth with letters, or you can actually just say, you know, I'm gonna take the time and uh, try and perfect this request and uh, hopefully get records far quicker. Yes, Chelsea Manning. Hi, I have my own, I have my own experience with FOIA, uh, but uh, I, so I hear. Yes, so uh, so about ten years ago, the government, uh, by a FOIA amendment act, created the uh, was forced to create the Office of Government Information Services. Right. What has your been your experience with OGIS, and is it useful? Is it is it like what is like, what's the point of it from a journalist perspective? So. Uh, it's a, that's, a, that's a really good question. So the Office of Government Information Services is sort of this, you know, ombudsman, right? The FOIA ombudsman. And uh, there are times when, you know, um, Barry was mentioning earlier, are there any penalties, you know, uh, when, gov when a government agency says that they don't have documents? And not everyone can sue. So the Office of Government Information Services is there to sort of help, you know, um, work, you know, be, be an arbitrator, so to speak. Um, they're not holding anyone accountable, but they're still going to see if like, well, let me see if we can help you get the records that you're looking for. Um, and not, every, not everyone can sue for records, so it's sort of this last line of defense. With all of that said, um, I think that it's really great that they're there, and I think that they can provide some valuable and useful information. In, in, in terms of how to um, create a request or prepare a request far better. I have not had um, uh, great success in, in getting, you know, getting records released. So um, I certainly, w you know, would not discourage anyone from using, you know, OGIS, uh, which they're known as. But um, I, think it's, I think it's valuable that they're there. I think that at the same time, though, it really depends what you're looking for. If I'm looking for a document from the CIA, right, uh, could be any document. Um, generally, everything at the CIA is classified because of what the CIA does, and that goes for the NSA as well. And so if the CIA says, I'm not giving this to you, it really doesn't make sense to go to OGIS, in my opinion, because it's just, you know, it's just gonna be difficult for them to get it. However, uh, if you're trying to get something from, you know, uh, a smaller agency, perhaps, that would be helpful. Um, so it, it really depends on what your, what your document is, what you're trying to get, and, uh, um, you know, the, the classified nature of the record. I hope that answers the question. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Hi, well, thanks for sharing with us all the valuable information. I really appreciate your perspectives, especially, well, um, you know, when you've been using, you've been use, using FOA to obtain very valuable information that everyone should be aware of that the government is doing. But there is one thing that I'm uh, curious about what your view on this is. So there is, so, and I actually just came to be aware of the fact. So you can actually use FOA to obtain foreign citizens' information, from, uh, information especially at the port of entry and their exit in, in and out of the United States. So I was just wondering, well, in the, and you can actually get the full record, like their name, their birth date, and uh, you know their exit and e exit and entry information to the United States. I think it's up to five or seven years or so. So I was just wondering, well, and it's from the DHS, one of the offices of the DHS. So I was just wondering, well, in in the quest of FOA, and is what are some of the uh, let's say balances and checks? What are some of the good ethical practices that you could share with us? That while we are getting valuable information from government agencies. Agencies and where that and while not, well, violating let's say uh, foreign citizens' privacies. 
That, that's a good question, and I'm, I'm going to be honest, I, I am not too familiar with that aspect of it um, in terms of obtaining that specific type of information. Because whenever I ask the government for information on anyone, um, anyone that's alive, uh, and, and, it, and in the past it's also meant uh, foreign citizens, I am told I need a privacy waiver. That means that you know, I'm asking for records on a third party and that person needs to provide me with permission. So I haven't experienced that uh, and I'm not familiar with the government handing out um, uh, personal identifiable information on, on foreign citizens. I mean, I asked for records on uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and they said I needed to get Khalid Sheikh Mohammed's permission. Uh, no joke. Uh, they actually, the, the CIA and um, uh, Department of Defense said that. So, uh, you know, I, I don't know about that specific, uh, I don't have insight into, into that um, specific example, but I will tell you this, that in terms of, you know, checks and balances, um, it's, we're not getting, it's, it's not as, I, I, there's never been an instance where, okay, there's one instance where the government actually gave me, you know, a record. It was a CIA. It was a letter that John Brennan wrote to Dianne Feinstein apologizing for spying, uh, for, for the uh, CIA spying on the Senate uh, when they were investigating the CIA's torture program. And I later found out that this letter was never sent to Dianne Feinstein. And I got a phone call from the CIA, um, from you know, public affairs, not like the CIA, um, saying, hey, we gave that to you by accident. Um, can you not post it? And you know, mind you, for a month, I've been struggling with this story, um, and I just got the lead to my story. I was like, I hear you. And I hung up the phone and I was like, type, 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 type. Um, so, you know, it's really, really rare that, um, that information is released through FOIA accidentally where there's, you know, revelatory information about private individuals. I've, I've never, you know, as many FOIA requests as I've filed and as many times as I've tried to you know, obtain information in, in that way. I've just never seen that. Uh, I've seen more of a, you know, heavy-handed, you know, redaction marker all over it. So, um, you know, I think it's probably a case-by-case -case basis because it's so minimal. But, it, but it's, a, it, it's an interesting question. I'll certainly look into, you know, what you're referring to there. Hello. There we go. Um, I'm wondering, do you always get a, an envelope with a stack of paper? And do they release electronic records? And, and in general, once you receive records, what kind of software tools or strategies do you use yeah. to, for instance, like find the word Muslim in 100,000 emails? I'm thinking of like the release of the uh, foreign accounts sure. information. Um, I have another funny story about that. Uh, so I'll always, whenever I'm requesting records, I always ask for, for electronic uh, copies of records. For some reason, the CIA refuses to release records electronically. Only we'll do it through, uh, with paper. In fact, I think they're being sued, not by me, by someone else, for um, failing to release electronic copies of records. There was one time when the Army um, sent me documents on a mini disc. Do you remember what those mini discs were? And no joke, this was like that big. And I, I was so taken aback by this, but also so curious that I was like, oh, a mini disc. But, and I put it into my computer. And I don't know what I was thinking because it got stuck and, you know, my computer broke. Um, so, you know, agencies release, you know, documents in, in various forms, paper, you know, on disk. The FBI still releases, you know, on CD. Uh, I think that was the general 
question that you had about how the form that's released. Right. So, um, I mean, you know, with the with Hillary Clinton's emails, it wasn't just released to me. They were releasing it. State Department was releasing it. You know, um, to everyone. Um, you know, I, I'm kind of not. I, I, I'll simply just OCR the records and then r go through it. Um, I literally read every single thing on a you know on a document. So. Um, I leave that more to you know, you know, to the tech folks who, you know, make it, you know, that that will um, house it in a way where it's easily accessible and searchable. Um, I'll tell you though, having having uh, reviewed documents in that way, like the raw document, um, that's how I want to read it. It uh, I feel like I'm missing. I may be missing information if I read it another way. So generally, I just kind of put it out there. Um, I mean, it, it's you compile it into one large document and throw it out there. And then what happens is other folks take it and then you know put it into this nice database. And uh, so I, I kind of stay out of it on that end. Chair. I'm wondering um, <laughs> if um, with stuff like emails and stuff, if those are released in uh, as hard copies, is there digital metadata that's being lost? Is the, I'm sorry, is there um, digital? Metadata like, uh, you know, IP addresses or, or whatever that... Yes, yeah, uh, it is. and. Um, you know, I wanted to mention this as well, so thank you for that question. Um, recently, I filed a request with, I think it was the, yes, it was the FCC, and I essentially just asked for the email header and the metadata for, you know, a certain official's emails, uh, because what I was receiving uh, was hard copies, and that was being lost, and I wanted that. I wanted to you know, take a look at it and, and, you know, somebody I was working with also thought it was, you know, valuable to have that. Um, so that actually requires its own separate requests. Uh, and, uh, you know, you can fight with the agency when it comes to releasing, you know, you ask for records electronically, they decide to release it to you on paper. Um, you know, I, I'll call them on the phone and, and, you know, see if they'll fork it over. But, uh, you know, that missing information. But yes, that is, you are missing that, and then you end up having to f file a separate request. I'll note that when you do that, if you're looking for that type of information, it's fairly quick. Uh, it doesn't take very long. They'll just send it to you. Um, but again, you know, these are things that we shouldn't have to do. Um, you know, one tip that, I, that I'll share that, I've, that I um, uh, didn't, uh, uh, previously when I was speaking uh, about sort of this, you know, larger world of FOIA is e emails are very valuable. Um, they're also very difficult to get, believe it or not. Uh, and the reason is is because it goes through this multi-level review, uh, particularly if it's a, a, an email chain. There's various, you know, officials on that chain. So if I'm asking for a month's worth of emails, you can imagine maybe there's thousands of emails. You know, if you're looking to get an idea of what an official was talking about, sometimes you can just ask for one day's worth of emails. You know, I start, I, I've been doing that more often because of the backlog, um, but it's also to get an idea of what are they communicating about that day. Maybe there's a tip in here. Uh, so I try to use that almost as a tip sheet. Um, if it's uh, Scott Pruitt, for example, and there was, a, I don't know, some big policy decision that was... Uh, being discussed about climate change. You know, I would like the emails for one day. Um, and, and I found that that comes, you know, fairly quick. So you have to, you, you also have to think about, you know, how to target your FOIA request in such a way that you'll end up with those records, the responsive records, uh, in a more timely fashion. And then from there, you can kind of expand the scope of what you're looking for. 
Does archive.org have a channel so that the information that's gathered in the FOIA request can be made available at archive.org? Uh, Lisa? <laughs> That's a good question for Brewster. Um, so why don't I give him the microphone? Luckily, we have him right here. Uh, not yet. We'd love it. I think there are uh, some collections of FOIA documents, but not a steady stream. We'd love to have more. In I'll the be happy to give you all of the, my documents. And Woohoo! Let's yeah. round of applause on that. Woohoo! We're on it. That was wonderful. Huh? What? Electronic. Yes. Uh, yes. yes. Electronic on paper. I actually um, still have this pile of paper documents uh, that's uh, collecting dust that I, I haven't gone through. It's from it's from the State Department, and uh, I th I feel like this was truly punishment for you know the number of lawsuits I filed against them. But they just sent me this this it was like a stack. It like comes up to it's like three feet high. And when they mailed it to me, um, I looked at the postage. It was $245. <laughs> they spent $245 mailing documents. Wow. OK, we're going to have one last question. And after one question from the interwebs, uh, they're wondering if you are going to set up a pursuance for your FOIA. If I'm going to what? If you would set up a pursuance. Uh, oh, you were, were you here for the demo earlier? Uh-oh. Bar Bar Barrett Brown pursuance. and Steve demoed their pursuance project, which is a, uh, it's an encrypted um, project management system with a lot of tools in it so people can collaborate all over the world and drill down like investigative journalist style. And it actually lines, aligns with some things Aaron wrote about and we were really excited about it like an hour ago. So cool. that's why they're like, would you do one for your FOIA You're work? On the spot. Sure, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, Thank you very much. Yes. They're happy to. Is it? Oh, okay, it's going. Um, so something you said just a minute ago is that, um, you know, getting the email headers in a separate request is not something that you should have to do. So right. my question is, um, I'm sort of inviting you to, to, to rewrite FOIA. How should government transparency work and, you know, how would you make it type of thing? Um, I, I mean, going on a, a point that uh, Barry Eisler made earlier, um, you know, I had the opportunity to testify before Congress uh, for a congressional committee a couple of years ago about the Freedom of Information Act. And uh, I mean, it's really simple, which is what I said in this testimony, which is these agencies need to follow the law. Um, it's, it's that simple. If they were to follow the law, and, and uh, uh, abide by what the Freedom of, Informa Freedom of Information Act states, um, you know, I wouldn't be bad-mouthing them uh, all the time. And, but most importantly, the only way to get the Freedom of Information Act to work effectively, and this is just my personal opinion, is by uh, administering penalties to agencies and agency officials uh, who thwart requesters and withhold documents, you know, f and lie about it. Um, but uh, that's how it would, I feel it would be effective. Because right now there's just, you know, you're, you're asking for the records, um, an agency can say yay or nay, you know. Um, um, it's, it, 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 particularly when you have such a massive backlog. So, you know, following the law says, you know, it says I should be able to get these records. There's now a new amendments to the law that's supposed to make it much uh, far easier for us to get the records and they're still not, you know, following that. So it's, it's actually simple. But the penalty component to me is crucial. That is the most important. And I think that if that were there, uh, you know, there'd be more of an incentive to, um, to respond quicker and to get those records out. Okay. Um, so, in terms of it, with your experience, could there be a template developed to 
uh, send out FOIA requests more efficiently to actually weaponize FOIA? <laughs> to actually weaponize FOIA? Yes. Um, and that's I don't know if I want to answer that question. Um, <laughs> I'm sure that somebody, you know, no, here no, no, no. could come up with something It doesn't like that. have to be weaponizing FOIA. It does, we don't have to do it so much that we're just clogging things up for no reason. But we could automate it. We're working on the, I'm working on something like it right now with the police surveillance equipment, like I was talking about earlier. So we can automate it. Daniel Rigmaiden is going to help me do it for this police surveillance thing. And basically, just to make it easy for me to fill out a bunch of FOIA requests in my town and give you the template that I used, and you can fill them out in your town. And then we can have, because we really have to do these towns one by one, like it's no joke. We have to go local agency, local agency, I mean, right? Yeah, you could use it local and, and federal. But I also want to make, you know, since you said weaponized FOIA, I mean, I, yeah. I really took great offense when the NSA said that about me. I mean, um, every request that I file is not just, you know, I'm going to get, you know, I'm, I'm going to, I'm trying to hurt the government. I, I, I truly believe, one, that this information needs to be released because it's our right to have this information. Uh, and uh, I certainly also feel that there's incredible import, you know, news value uh, there as well. Um, so, you know, I don't, you know, when, when the government said that, it was offensive. I mean, I, I don't weaponize the Freedom of Information Act. As I noted, as a journalist, it's incredibly difficult, incredibly difficult to be a journalist right now. It's incredibly difficult to obtain information. It's incredibly difficult to get people, you know, to talk. And what I found over the years, particularly as a national security reporter, was that when I was, when I've been successful in getting the CIA or the NSA or the Department of Defense to declassify records, on a program, the people who were fearful about speaking suddenly felt at ease because this was declassified. They can talk about something that, that they may know about. Um, and, uh, you know, so the fact that government agencies, you know, look upon me and other, you know, people that they refer to as vexatious requesters. Uh, as you know, a thorn in their side is just incredibly offensive. So, um, so I don't discourage you from weaponizing FOIA and uh, encourage you to, you know, make good use of it. Right, so and, and there can be a middle ground where we're not weaponizing it, but we're making it a lot more easier to do it. And I'm hoping maybe if we made it easier too, maybe the press, the other press people that call themselves reporters, might use FOIA yes. too and get. It, 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 the last thing I'll note that, that um, you know, the federal government is doing to make it even easier is, and it's my understanding that this is actually happening, is that uh, they are putting together a universal portal. So a portal where you can just go to one place now. Uh, it's supposed to be up, I think, next year. I'm not sure. Uh, it's the federal government, so maybe longer, um, where you can go to just one place and file all of these you know, file all your Freedom of Information Act requests. The way it works now is you've got some agencies that use, you know, that, that want you to use FOIA online. You know, you have the FBI now that has eFOIA, and, you know, you may not want to put in some information in there. Um, you know, they, there's many different places. Now there's supposed to be, you know, one-stop shopping uh, for federal FOIA. So thank you, everyone. It's really... Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Okay, everybody. So we're going to take a break. We're going to be back in um, less than an hour, actually, because we have to start on time at 7.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time because we have too many speakers to be able to uh, hang out and be late. Kind of, we've been we've been taking our time today because it it was really hard to get all these people together today, and I I didn't want to cut the questions short and stuff because I, I I have the same feeling you guys do, and it's like this is our chance to to get at them and get the information we needed. So we were able to do that, but we do have to start on time at 7:30. So this is Aaron Palooza tonight. We have a lot of speakers, but they're all just talking for like seven minutes until the last couple speakers go longer but so it's actually going to go really quick and there's a lot of important interesting things that people are going to say so eat lots of food and we'll be back soon <laughs> <laughs>